but for now, and probably the foreseeable future, you're going to use a lot of NSAIDs. And NSAIDs stands for nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. All right, which you'd think just by the name would mean all this lecture that I've talked about, because I've talked about controlled inflammation by anything but a steroid. But when you say NSAID, what you're really talking about is a cyclooxygenase inhibitor. Okay, so you still get the the arachidonic acid being <laughs> produced, but you're blocking that conversion of arachidonic acid into the prostaglandins. And these. Uh, always have three beneficial effects that we're looking for. They're anti-inflammatory, they're analgesic, and they're antipyretic. So they control fevers, they control pain, and they lessen inflammation. Now the anti-inflammatory part occurs, but we usually are not using it for that purpose, okay? Um, compared to a steroid, NSAIDs are weak anti-inflammatories. Steroids are so much better in controlling inflammation than an NSAID, it, it, it's, it's ridiculous. But they do have some effect as uh, controlling inflammation, but mostly you'll use it to control pain and occasionally you'll use it to control fevers. All right. Now, um, <clears throat> Going back to the whole thing with the stomach uh, and the kidney, this brings us to the toxicities. The, if you use these, you need to know how to use them and what to watch for because you have a few things that can happen. Again, the GI ulceration, prostaglandin E produces that normal cytoprotective mucus. When it's gone, you get a thin, watery mucus that doesn't protect against the stomach acid, and you can get a uh, ulcer. Gastric ulcer particularly, but we also see them in other parts of the GI tract, intestinal and colonic, primarily gastric, gastric though. Now, when we come to uh, the GI drugs, I'll talk about misoprostol. It's a synthetic prostaglandin E that we give specifically to um, return that cytoprotective mucus and uh, treat the ulcer. And particularly, if you have an NSAID-induced ulcer, this is the anti-ulcer medication that we want to use. We have talked to you later about omeprazole and ranitidine and uh, famotidine, all acid suppressors. Acid suppressors are part of an anti-ulcer protocol, but for NSAID-induced ulcers, we want to actually replace that missing prostaglandin. Okay. Again, uh, <clears throat> prostaglandins are not necessary for normal renal blood flow, but they are for compensatory renal blood flow. And so if you have a dehydrated or hypovolemic or hypotensive animal and he's um, trying to maintain his GFR by local prostaglandin release and you block that, you can get ischemic injury to the kidney and renal papillary necrosis. Now platelets are kind of interesting. Um, <clears throat> All non-selectives, and, and there are two subsets of cyclooxygenase. There's cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2. Non-selective means they inhibit both subsets. All right. All of these affect platelets to some degree uh, and inhibit them by inhibiting thromboxane. Again, thromboxane is one of the prostaglandins produced by cyclooxygenase. And uh, thromboxane is procoagulatory. It causes platelet aggregation. All right, so all of these have some inhibition of platelet, okay? And if you, if you ever go to uh, have surgery, one of the things the surgeon will say is you can't take uh, NSAIDs um, uh, for 48, 72 hours, and that's because they don't want you bleeding. Um, now, aspirin is unique, however, because it permanently inactivates the thromboxane of the platelet. For all the other NSAIDs, the thromboxane is only inhibited while the drug is there. When the drug is gone, uh, the platelet returns to its normal function. With aspirin, it's a permanent inhibition. The only way you get uh, rid of that inhibition is to replace the platelet. All right. So that's a big difference in aspirin. Uh, 
I had some nasal surgery and they told me that and they said you can't take any NSAIDs uh, or uh, Tylenol, acetaminophen. And I said, but acetaminophen doesn't affect platelets. <laughs> and they said, you can't take it anyway. <laughs> this was the, the, the nurse telling me this. And so I went home and avoided the NSAIDs and took my Tylenol. <laughs> I needed it because there's no reason to. I think, that, I think the underlying thought was most people are too stupid to know there's a difference between Tylenol and ibuprofen. Uh, so uh, if it comes to it, acetaminophen does not inhibit platelet function. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so that's a biggie we'll talk about. Now these last two are type B. Remember that means idiosyncratic. We don't know why it occurs, typically at a fairly low rate. Uh, bone marrow suppression, you probably don't see that very often, but one you hear a lot about with NSAIDs is hepatotoxicity, especially you've heard about it with Remedil. Again, we can't predict which dogs will develop it Probably we think some sort of genetic difference in the way they metabolize the drug, but you can see hepatotoxicity as a type B adverse reaction. All right, so these are non-selectives. Most of what we use in small animals now are COX-2 selectives. Uh, so COX-1 is involved more in constitutive housekeeping, mucus production, renal blood flow. COX-2 is more inducible and associated more with pain and inflammation. So they said, let's make a selective COX-2 so we maintain our good stuff that we want our prostaglandins to do while inhibiting the bad COX-2 uh, to get rid of pain and inflammation. So um, this was supposed to give us better um, um, control of the pain, or not better control of the pain, fewer side effects. And that is true with GI. You definitely do have a risk, lower risk of GI ulceration when you use a COX-2 selective. It's not non-existent. You can cause a GI ulcer with a COX-2 selective. You just have to uh, give higher doses, more prolonged, inappropriate use, all right, or pre-existing ulcers. Renal injury is still possible though. Uh, it's, it turns out that COX-1 is not the only prostaglandin or uh, cyclogenase involved in, in renal prostaglandin production. COX-2 still produces some prostaglandins that are involved, so you can still have renal injury. How it compares is unknown. I suspect it's a little less than COX-1 non-selectives, uh, but we still worry about it. Now platelet function in man, it's exactly the opposite. In man, it inhibits the endothelian prostacyclin, <coughs> and this is our normal anticoagulant from the endothelium. So it actually winds up being procoagulatory. You probably have seen the ads for Celebrex. Celebrex is uh, celecoxib, it's a COX-2 selective for man. When these first came out, there were at least three COX-2 selectives. And then people started having heart attacks. So they removed two. Celebrex is the only one left, and it carries a warning about this very thing, okay? So um, uh, because of this, uh, COX-2s actually seem in man to be procoagulatory. Uh, Dr. Mackin's group has looked at it and it, it's unclear. It's kind of the bottom line of the effect of COX-2 in platelets in small animals. They've had kind of conflicting results, so uh, um, pretty variable and unclear. We still have the uh, adverse reactions. You can see bone marrow suppression and hepatotoxicity. Again, the hepatotoxicity being the more common thing you hear about. All right, before I get into actual individual NSAIDs, I want to point out that this selectivity I've been talking about is dependent on the methodology and most importantly, the species tested. All right, so uh, a 
drug that is a COX-2 selective in the dog is not necessarily a COX-2 selective in the cat or the horse or the cow. All right, it's species dependent. All right, in fact, usually they're not similarly COX selective. So uh, you can't just, um, uh, you know, your, your nurse practitioner comes in with this new COX-2 selective for their dog and wants to try it, don't do that. All right, uh, you don't know. And also there are tremendous differences in species, metabolism, and excretion. NSAIDs is, is one of the worst drug categories to make extrapolations between species. Until someone figures out that it can be used in the right dose, don't do it, okay? <laughs> don't use one you don't uh, know what's going to happen, all right? There are some disease interactions. Uh, the NSAIDs, by blocking the vasodilatory prostaglandins, can increase blood pressure. That's not so much. I'm going to rechange this slide. I'm going to divide this slide, I think, into anti effects on, on hypertension versus congestive heart failure. The lack of vasodilation affects more blood pressure. And you can see here they can blunt the antihypertensive effects of ACE inhibitors. But uh, relative to heart failure, they can increase salt and water retention, again, by blocking uh, uh, renal prostaglandins that would normally get rid of sodium. Uh, and diuretics can be blocked somewhat um, by these mechanisms. And it may um, predispose to hyperkalemia. Remember, spironolactone, the aldosterone antagonist, is called a potassium sparing diuretic. We really want to make sure that they don't get hyperkalemic. On all the other um, diuretics, on furosemide, we're concerned about hypokalemia. On spironolactone, we're concerned about hyperkalemia. You add an NSAID to that, you definitely want to monitor their, their potassium. Okay, and um, <coughs> the NSAIDs have caused some falsely low total T4s, particularly Butte and aspirin have done this. So you want to run free T4s or TSH. Uh, there have been animals misdiagnosed as being hypothyroid because they were on an NSAID. So total T4s are okay for screening but you don't want to make a diagnosis off a of total T4, typically period, but especially if they're on an inset. Okay. <clears throat>